Good day and welcome to the wrist and hand fracture lecture. The objectives for this lecture are the following. To recognize and diagnose upper limb fractures specifically in the wrist and hand, we will look at distal radius fractures, base of the thumb, the scaphoid, metacarpal and phalangeal fractures. Also, you should be able to then discuss the best management, either non-operative or operative for these fractures. And also then discuss if you've decided that the specific fracture needs surgical intervention, what type of surgical management would you think will be best for that individual? Metacarpal fractures. So the metacarpal fractures are normally classified where and what type of fracture it is. So the pattern, is it a transverse, is it an oblique, is it a spiral fracture pattern? And then also where exactly in the metacarpal bone has the fracture occurred? Is it in the metacarpal neck, most distally? Is it on the head? The head you'll find if you if you make a fist, you will see your knuckles protruding. That is the head of the metacarpal. Just below that is the neck. Then moving distally is the shaft. And right at the end before the carpal bones is the base. So this, for instance, in this image is a fifth Fifth meaning is the little finger. If it was the second, it was the index finger. Remember how we count? We count with hand fractures or injuries. The thumb is number one, index two, middle three, ring four, little finger five. So this is a boxes fracture. Boxes fracture is the, the fifth metacarpal neck fracture. That occurs with when a person hits their fist against an object or even in motor car accidents. The angulation can be where the apex angulates dorsally and the head moves down. So if there's more than 30 degrees of angulation present then the grip strength will be weakened and the range of motion of the metacarpal decreased. And also then, if there's more than 50% of angulation, there's a compensatory hyperextension in the metacarpal phalangeal joint. So the decision here is with a fracture, the metacarpal neck is whether it will be an operative management with K wires or it will be a reduction and immobilization. Literature has shown that conservative management, even with body taping, the fifth finger to the forefinger, little to ring finger, gives the similar functional outcomes as compared to operative management or other types of splinting. The only downfall here is the cosmetic look of the hand where the person often misses the knuckle. They say they, don't, they can't see the knuckle of the little finger. When considering the different types of management options, conservative management Example, the right at the top of your slide is a hand base splint with the metacarpals in a slightly flexed 50% to 70% metacarpal flexion. The wrist is not included in the splint as the wrist was not injured right, so it's important to keep it open. And also a sandwich splint 
can be fabricated. So the standard splint is where the splint encases the volar and palmar aspect or the volar and the dorsal aspect overlying the fracture. But that is normally used for shaft mesocarpal shaft fractures that are conservatively managed and non-displaced. And then commence slow active mobilization after the splinting period according to the, the doctor's protocol and progressive strengthening, not early strengthening before seven to eight weeks. Surgical management can be done K-wise, screw fixation, and then a short period of sandwich splint. But normally not six weeks after surgical, but more for conservative management. And then slow progressive strengthening. Always remember that you do not want to start squeezing any balls or therapy too soon. Right? Strengthening only from seven to eight weeks after a hand fracture. Moving to the metacarpal shaft fracture, you will see that a two millimeter shortening produced by the fracture gives a loss of seven degrees metacarpal metaphalangeal extension at your MCP joint. When it's an oblique fracture and there's a five degree rotation, for every five degrees of rotation, the finger when making a fist, the one finger affected will overlap the other finger by 1.5 centimeters and this is often the biggest concern is this overlapping finger when making a fist. So it's very important to get a proper AP. A proper AP x-ray is if the patient seated, shoulder abducted, elbow flexed and hand neutral flat and they take an x-ray from anterior to posterior. So the views are, and also the lateral view, very important to determine the fractures in the hand and wrist. If it's a long oblique fracture, they are inherently unstable and a minimum intervention of a reduction with KYs are required. And these type of shaft injuries are often sports like hockey, with hockey sticks, people hitting each other accidentally, hopefully on the hand, and then also in motor vehicle accidents. Now we look at a Bennett fracture. It is the most common fracture at the base of the thumb. The mechanism of injury is an actual load in a slightly flexed thumb. Like, for instance, a fall when holding a skiing pole and falling on your thumb. It's intraarticular at the ulnar palmar first metacarpal base. So this will also affect the management decision making. Associate injuries with that is your carpal bone fracture, carpal bone fracture, the trapezium, in your dis it's most radially in your distal carpal row, row, your ulnar collateral ligament can also be injured. During a fracture, the metacarpal shaft subluxes dorsally, proximally, radially due to a, diff a few different muscles acting on it. Muscles are your abductor, Pollicis brevis, your adductor pollicis brevis, your extensor pollicis longus, and the segment remains attached. So it, it, it is often an avulsion fracture. 
The x-rays that you will require to diagnose the ben a Bennett fracture is an AP, new lateral, oblique views, and also two different views, Robert and the Betts view. There is a grid up classification of Bennett fractures. A type 1 is when a fracture has a single ulnar fragment and subluxation of the metacarpal base. A type 2, according to Greta classification, is an impaction fracture without subluxation of the first metacarpal. Type 3, an injury with a small ulnar avulsion fragment in association with metacarpal dislocation. So, the management of these type of fractures. Until the 1970s, the preferred method was a closed reduction and a splint, with the splint an example shown at the right bottom of the slide. But a closed reduction and percutaneous K wire as well as an open reduction with interfragmental screws or K-wires are now the trend. A Rolando fracture is a comminuted articular base of the first metacarpal fracture and it often has a Y or a T shape. It is a two-part articular fracture and it occurs often with compress compression forces along the shaft axis in a slightly flexed carpal metacarpal joint. The x-rays you'll need to diagnose this fracture is an oblique view, a robot view. A robot view is a true AP of the thumb with the forearm in maximal pronation, with the dorsum of the thumb against the cassette of the x-ray machine. Then a true lateral of the thumb is needed with the hand pronated to 30 degrees, and the radiographic beam is then angled 15 degrees distally. And this is to capture that very specific T and Y shape of this fracture to diagnose. A CT scan may be asked for operative planning just to look at the different segments of the fracture. Due to the Y and the T pattern of a Rolando fracture, the management is a bit more complex than the Bennett fracture. It depends on the number of fragments as well as the displacement of the various fragments. When a conservative approach is decided on, it will be a closed reduction and immobilization in a thumb spiker splint or a POP. If it's extra articular fracture, Minimally displaced two-part articular fracture with less than one millimeter displacement. These are the indications for a more conservative approach of management. If operative, then a close reduction in K-wire is an option. Open reduction, internal fixation. Or distraction and external fixation, also options. The surgery can be done arthroscopically or open with plates and screws, tension band or K-wires. In this picture you will see uh, open reduction internal fixation for a Rolando fracture with plate and screws. We now move to the fractures in the fingers. The phalangeal fractures. So the proximal and middle phalanx has a head, neck, shaft and base when considering the osteology. A distal phalanx right at the tip has got a tuck 
because of the nail bed, a shaft and a base. The mechanism of injury when sustaining a phalangeal fracture can be a crush, somebody stepping on a foot in a rugby match with a, a, a rugby shoe, a direct pressure, blunt or penetrating trauma, like a car door slamming on a finger or a hammer hitting, trying to hit a nail and they miss and they hit a finger. So majority of the trauma in hand results in phalangeal injuries more than any other type of injury. I think 46%, 36% of major trauma results in metacarpal injury. The most injured phalanx, the distal part, and then the border digits, meaning the thumb and the little finger. The most commonly injured finger is the fifth finger. We now look at proximal phalangeal fractures. They are distal to the metacarpal bone and the stability comes from the extensor and the flexor tendons, crossing them dorsally and bolally, collateral ligaments, and volar plates. A fracture occurs in the apex volar angulation, where the proximal fragment is pulled by the interosseous muscles into flexion. Extensor digitorum communis central slip extends the distal phalanx. So when considering fractures in the fingers, the balance between the flexor and the extensor tendons and their attachments are vital to see, but where exactly is the fracture line and which one of these tendon slips can pull that fragment either into a dorsal or a volar direction. X-rays needed a pure PA, lateral or oblique views. CT is really needed only for operative planning when there's a complex periarticular fracture or in the presence of a foreign unknown body. MRI looks at soft tissue for example, tumors detecting foreign objects, or if the diagnosis is unclear. When considering the management options for, for proximal phalangeal fractures, non-operative is when it is less than 10 degree of angulation and less than two millimeters of shortening with no rotational deformity present and it is not into a joint, it's extra articular. Also when it is a stable transverse pattern fracture, then a non-operative approach can be done. Splint for three weeks can be used and can be a hand base splint as was used for the metacarpal neck fracture and also then to depending on if it is the base of the proximal phalanx then the metacarpal joint may also be included in a hand base splint but not the wrist included and also then an in intrinsic plus position meaning in the position where you would hold uh, your fingers, flex your fingers at the metacarpal joints, that is an intrinsic plus position. So you'll put the metacarpals in slight flexion. And after that, body strapping is also good, after the three weeks. Just to guide and, and, and get the person to use that finger. Remember, unaffected fingers can still be used 
Let's say, for instance, that a proximal phalanx, if the little finger is involved, then the thumb, index, middle finger can definitely be used for manipulation um, of objects, supporting, dressing, clothing, ADL activities. So it is not necessary to immobilize the entire hand, please. Here you can also see if it is more distal, proximal phalanx, closer to the PIPJ, proximal interphalangeal joint, then a static finger extension splint can be used. And you don't have to include the metacarpal joint. It just depends on where the fragment is and what forces act on it. Operative management is normally used for an unstable fracture. So if it's reduced, but the stability cannot be maintained, then closed reduction internal fixation will be used with a K wire. Intraarticular fracture displacement is where if it's intraarticular and then an RF is indicated, and if it is severely displaced, an RF is indicated. The surgical techniques and equipment that will be used may be K wires, mini fragment plates and screws, interfragmentary lag screws for long oblique fractures. Moving to the fractures a bit more distally, the middle phalangeal fracture. There are two main insertions of tendons on the middle phalanx. On the dorsal side, there's the extensor digitorum communis central slip. And on the volus side, it's the flexor digitorum superficialis insertion. So you can imagine, depending on where the fracture occurs, that there will be angulation. And it is dependent on the location of the fracture. Can it either be apex dorsal movement or volar, apex volar angulation? Apex dorsal angulation occurs more with a proximal, a fracture proximal to the FDS insertion. And that means the central slip of the EDC displaces the segment. When there's an apex volar angulation, the fracture is distal to the FDS insertion. If the fracture is in the middle third angle, it can angle either in a volar or a dorsal direction or no angulation at all because of the inherent stability provided by the flexor and extensor tendons and their insertions. Still looking at the middle phalangeal fractures, a specific type of fracture is the pilon fracture. It's a proximal intraarticular fracture and may be comminuted with an axial load. If it incorporates the volar part of the proximal base where the fracture is, and it includes 40% of the articular surface, then the majority of the collateral ligament insertions, the volar plate and the accessory lig ligaments are also involved. And that this is an inherently unstable fracture. Here it is important to also know in all your orthopedic principles that it is not just purely a bone fracture that, that occurred. You have to remember the soft tissue the ligaments, the tendons, the muscles, the soft tissue, the edema, and not only think about the fractured bone. With that, there's a lot of lot we can do as physiotherapy with our tools to manage the appropriate healing of the soft tissue. May it be a muscle, a tendon, a ligament. Right, so the dorsal proximal base fracture 
is often an avulsion of the extensor digitum from an essential slip. Now we look at the management of middle phalangeal fractures. So a non-operative management will include two to three weeks of dynamic splinting if there's no displacement. Operative management is for transverse fractures with more than 10 degrees of angulation or 2 millimeters shortening, so more than 2 millimeters shortening, or if there's any rotational deformity, then operative management is the choice. Then either a close reduction percutaneous pinning with K wires versus an open reduction internal fixation. So if the fracture is irreducible and unstable, then a closed reduction percutaneous pinning is not the option. Then an open reduction internal fixation is indicated. As you can see in the, the picture on the right bottom, there's plates and screws used, as well as a K-wire. And when considering the topmost distal screw, you can see that it, it penetrates and moves into the soft tissue. So that is a concern for flexor tendon fraying and injury. So post-operative x-rays, even under C-arm, is crucial to make sure that there are no screws sticking out or into any joints. Moving to the most distal fractures in the upper limb is the distal phalangeal fractures. Looking at the anatomy, the DIPJ, the distal interphalangeal joint, is also surrounded by extensor and flexor tendons. It also has its own volar plate on the volar side, that's where the volar plate gets its name from, and collateral ligaments. The FDS inserts into the base of the middle phalanx, and the FDP inserts into the distal phalanx. Fractures here on are usually non-displaced or comminuted. And to classify these fractures can either be a tip or a tuft fracture, shaft or articular fracture. It's usually open when there's a, a nail bed injury and the nail bed and the surrounding soft tissue injury. So if you see that there's a nail bed injury, then it is considered open and require operative management. Intraarticular fractures, for example a mallet finger, is an injury of the terminal slip of the extensor tendon avulsion. The terminal slip comes from the EPC tendon and it is its final insertion into the finger. Looking at the flexor tendons, the flexor digitorum profundus avulsion is when the finger is forced into extension like a jersey finger. So this is in rugby where you, the player grabs and gets hold of the jersey of another player, tries to pull him back, but the player keeps on moving forward and the finger while flexing the DIPJ extends. So an FDP avulsion, a jersey finger, has to, this decision has to be made. Is it an avulsion of a bone or is it a tendon injury? If it is an avulsion of the bone, um, the management decision is different compared to a tendon injury, where tendon protocols need to be part of the management. 
looking at a seymour fracture, it's a displaced epiph epiphyseal distal phalangeal fracture with a nail bed injury. So it's a high flexion injury and the apex angulates dorsally and it presents similar to a mallet. So the mechanism of injury, as I've shared before, can be uh, a, something as simple as a jersey um, finger in rugby, crushing um, injuries, hitting the tip of the finger with a hammer. The management of the a distal phalangeal fracture depends if the nail bed is injured. Most of the distal phalangeal fractures heal without any surgical intervention necessary. And there's only a rate of 2% of non-union. So non-operative management includes a splint and not including the unaffected fingers the MPJ will not be included. The PIPJ will not be included. It will be for, for an example a mallet splint where only the DIP is a neutral or slight extension in a mallet splint. Important that the patient then wears the splint continuously for eight weeks. If they want to take it off and wash it, that is fine, but then the finger you have to educate them to take off the splint while their hand is placed on a table to maintain that finger slight hyperextension. Remember when you leave that DIP and it flexes then that terminal slip of the tendon is normally off and your eight weeks starts again. So when it is closed minimally displaced tendon avulsion that is can be non-operatively managed. Operative is when there's a volus suplex mallet finger fracture that involves 30% of the articular surface or a jersey finger injury. Open fracture with nail bed involvement where the seal of the nail plate, the hypernychium is broken or a displaced tuft fracture. Then oper operative management is indicated. The day of this injury, the management is a debridement and nail matrix repair and stenting of the nail fold.